Hi, I'm Dr. Jared Gardner, and I'm an Associate Professor of Pathology and Dermatology at the University of Arkansas for Medical Sciences, and I'm here today with Dr. Antonio Subtil, who is a dermatopathologist and hematopathologist in British Columbia, Canada. Mm -hmm. Tony, thanks for joining us today. Thanks for having me. All right, mm -hmm. so you like skin lymphomas, right? That's kind of your thing. Yeah, I do. How did you get into that? Well, during pathology residency, I really couldn't decide. You know, derm path and heme path were the you know favorite areas of pathology for me. So I figured, well, I, I could be happy doing either derm path or heme path, or maybe I'll be happier if I do both. So that's why I ended up doing both fellowships. Cool. And skin lymphoma is the perfect you know point that both areas meet. That makes sense. I, I feel kind of the same about soft tissue. It's soft tissue, when it yeah. comes in skin, mm -hmm. it works It works together well. Mm -hmm. But unlike you, I've always found um, heme things challenging, mm -hmm. even when they're in the skin. And I know I've mentioned this to you before, but you know, you gave that great talk last year at ASDP 2018, and I felt like the heavens opened up and it was oh. like, ah, I finally might be able to understand this. Mm -hmm. And then still I find cases that totally challenge that view. But sure. you, you wrote a book recently about mm -hmm. skin lymphoma as kind of a, a an approach, a practical approach. How did you decide to write that book? Well, I wish that I had that book when I was starting out. So that was my main goal, you know, that I would write a book that I wish I had, you know, when I was starting out. Cool. And um, I did Derm Path first, and then I did Heme Path Fellowship okay. after that. And on both fellowships, I noticed that people on both sides didn't like skin lymphoma. You know, so it's not just a Derm Path thing. Like people in Heme Path, they don't like to deal right. with those cases too. And I and I can see why because there are knowledge gaps on both sides. So yeah. one goal with the book was just to go over you know areas that both sides don't know much about. Yeah, what that is makes the sense. Clinical correlation for Heme Path people and some of the B cell markers, for example, or systemic lymphomas. Yeah you know, for the derm path fold. Yeah, I really found that aspect of your book actually really helpful that you really point out, you know, with the figure diagram of this is where this occurs on people usually. And this is the, you know, the tips of what you're looking for. So one, one problem I run into in my practice is I get a biopsy, and maybe it's on the nose, they say rule out basal cell, and it's a dense, small lymphocyte infiltrate in the dermis. And I'm always wondering, and maybe there's no EOs, and I think, well, could it be a bug bite? Well, why are there no EOs there? And I always wonder, so is this a reactive lymphoid hyperplasia, or is this just the top of a B-cell lymphoma, and how far do I work that up? Because sometimes I feel like I end up doing 10 immunostains or something, and then I end up saying, well, mm -hmm. it's probably reactive, I don't know. So like, how do you approach, I mean, you surely see little biopsies like that. How do you approach those in real life? Like, how far do you go? I often get a keratin, okay. you know, because I think obscure carcinoma, can okay. be very difficult to see on H and E. Yeah. So if they are thinking carcinoma clinically, and I see a dense lymphoid infiltrate, it could still be carcinoma. Okay, that's a good know? idea. Uh, and if the biopsy is too superficial, if I can barely see a dense infiltrate, it might not be worth doing too many immunos or even you know any. B cell markers or T cell markers, maybe getting a deeper biopsy. Okay. Better. Yeah, that's kind of how I've started. I might do a couple stains and then I'll tell them, look, it may be reactive. I just am not sure, but but maybe you know if it goes away, probably good. If it sure. comes back, do more. And mm -hmm. but I've always struggled with that over time. Of uh, you know, I don't want to ring up a huge amount of cost for the patient or um, or unnecessary angst, but I don't want to miss something, yeah. right? At that location, um, you might see patients with CLL. Okay. They might have a carcinoma oh. with incidental CLL. Well, nearby, maybe the biopsy just called the arrow Oh, well. yeah. So that's something to consider, especially in older patients. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's a good presentation for a small, medium-sized pleomorphic ah. CD4 positive LPD. Okay. So they often present with solitary lesions, you know, central face, and they're thinking BCC clinically. Right. So it's something to consider also. And those look, I always have thought those look kind of like a reactive thing, but they end up being clonal, right? Yeah, that so entity? if you do PCR, almost always you get a T-cell clone. Um, I don't use PCR as often anymore because okay. PD-1, immunostain, works great. Oh, okay, so cool. Be, so if you have a dense T cell infiltrate, small, medium-sized cells, you know, CD4 positive, 30 negative, and if I see PD-1 expression, that's good enough for me. Okay, that's good. And making sure that the lesion really is solitary. Uh, even though it behaves like pseudo-lymphoma, like, you know, it's very indolent, in indolent mm -hmm. that's why we use LPD. Uh, Lymphoproliferative disease, right, or disorder? Or disorder uh -huh. instead of lymphoma because they really behave, you know, in a very indolent manner. Okay. Now, I like to still, you know, label them as that, as, as that disease mm -hmm. because, you know, to this day, you know, there are still patients with MF, you know, that present with tumor stage. Right. And then that can be on the face. And oh, yeah. And he still overlaps a lot. It's four positive as well. You can have PD-1 expression in MF. 
So I, I like to make the diagnosis because at least that prompts the follow-up. That makes making sense. Making sure there's no MF, you know, patches or plaques elsewhere. And it's not common, but you could have a systemic tissue lymphoma that presents in the skin and looks a lot like that. Yeah, I always worry about that. Like, do you know? Do you think that every time there's a low-grade, what looks like a low-grade lymphoma in the skin, that's not like a non-mycosis mm -hmm. fungoides? Do you think that they should always get systemic workup, or only if they have palpable adenopathy, B symptoms? I always struggle. You know, do they need to do the full? complete, you know, workup or only if they seem like they're sick? I mean, how do you deal with that? I think there varies, you know, and, you know, there are issues of cost, uh -huh. you know, how far, you know, can the system afford to work up these patients? You know, I think there are legal issues also. Sometimes people do a workup because they don't want to miss, be missing sure. something potentially aggressive and then be sued for it. Uh, so there are other factors at play, but I think clinical correlation, you know, is there any adenopathy, like you mentioned, any B symptoms, mm -hmm. you know, any unexplained weight loss. So there might be some clues that something, you know, else is going yeah. on underlying, you know, in the patient, not just, you know, that solitary lesion. Okay. But I think if we just consider that, oh, these are all reactive, you know, it doesn't matter. I think that next step doesn't happen. So okay. I think it's too important to, you know, recognize, you know, that the category. That makes sense. Let me ask, let me shift gears and ask you about follicular mucinosis. Sure. I've heard some people say that follicular mucinosis is sometimes MF, sometimes or mycosis fungoides, sometimes it's, it's idiopathic, sometimes it can be like a reactive process. And I've heard other people claim that all follicular mucinosis is mycosis fungoides. Yeah. What's your take on this? Yeah, I think it is a bit controversial, uh, and I think the clinical is important in those cases. Okay. We have, you know, localized disease, is a young patient, you know, is there anything else, you know, going on? Any other type of lesions? Mm -hmm. You know, I think, you know, the controversy is higher for cases with disseminated disease. Sure. So if you have a young patient with lesions everywhere, you know, I think those cases are more complicated. Most of the time, it's the classic. You know, you have a, you know, a child with a localized small lesion, often mm -hmm. on the face or head and neck, as opposed to an older patient, you know, over 40, 40 50, and then they have, you know, areas of alopecia, you know, patches and plaque on head and neck. Mm -hmm. You know, most of the time it's pretty clear cut, clear cut clinically that they mm -hmm. have either. Okay. You know, and I think cases they are not obvious. You know, I think follow up and we biopsy. Okay. You know, can be a helpful way. Uh, in terms of the histo, I think if all you have is follicular mucinosis, you know, just the hair follicle with lots of lymphocytes and you know, disruption of architecture, increased mucin. If that's all you have, it's difficult just on H&E, you know, to tell them apart. Yeah. But if you have other features like, you know, is there epidermotropism, right? That's a feature of follicotropic MF. Sure. You know, do you have a dense lymphatic filtrate outside the hair follicle? Mm -hmm. so that's something that, that you don't see on the idiopathic, you know, benign. And that makes you worry MF. more for MF. MF. Okay. So is there anything else going on in the biopsy, you know, that might point towards MF, mm -hmm. you know, or not? Okay. What, you know, when I do consult cases for soft tissue pathology, I feel like there's certain things that I see again and again that, that pathologists that don't do soft tissue struggle with. Mm -hmm. What kinds of things do you see in skin lymphoma or skin heme path that are, that are issues that come up again and again that people really struggle with? Pitfalls that maybe we're not aware of. Yeah, well, I, I listed everything I could think of in the book. Uh -huh. you know, I think there. Are I was surprised. There were a lot of stuff I didn't know about, which I was really shocked. I think there are over 100 pearls and pitfalls throughout the book. Uh, but I think one thing that I see a lot is, I think a lot of pathologists, when they see a dance in the trade, they kind of freak out. Uh -huh. they, they stop, I do. <laughs> they stop thinking and they move straight to immunos. Uh -huh. And I think, you know, the clinical information, what, what's happening, you know, mm -hmm. what's the clinical story. And the H&E, like, look at the H&E, you know. Uh, and on the book I have the checklist mm -hmm. of what you look for, important negatives and positives. Yeah, I found that really useful. And, okay. Is the epithelium involved? Are the blood vessels involved? You know, is it involving adnexa? You know, uh, what are the cells in the infiltrate? Are they small, medium, large? Are there eels? Are there plasma cells? Are there lymphoid follicles? Uh, and what else is going on besides the infiltrate? Mm -hmm. Quite often, you do not need any immunostains. Okay. You know, let's say we have a dense infiltrate and then you see sebaceous gland necrosis. Oh, that could be herpes. Be herpes yeah. I've seen cases of Lashmania. They were called lymphoma wow. and had a bunch of, you know, special stains done. And all you needed was, you know, high power, you know, looking for the large main organisms and maybe doing a game cell in a fungal stain. I and, saw a molluscum like that once where it looked like it was lymphoma exactly. and on the deeper, the molluscum body sure. showed up and it had ruptured and just got yeah. so inflamed and it was mm -hmm. really surprising. So. so the mimics, you know, pseudolymphoma is very common. Yeah. You know, as a group, it's more common to have a pseudolymphoma than a lymphoma. So okay. I think just... 
you know, keep looking at the case. Look at the H&E, check with the clinical history, you know, and then you decide uh, on the pattern. And on the book I have, you know, the differential, both benign and malignant for each pattern. Mm -hmm. Is it epitheliotropic? Is it lots of EOs, lots of lymphoid follicles? And then once you have the differential, then you choose which stains to do. Uh -huh. So know. think first, then stain. Yeah, and, and quite often you don't need any stains. You that's could actually cool. solve the case with our derm path skills. And the I did code. not expect you to give me that answer, but that's really cool. Yeah. How do you, um, what's your approach to working up mycosis fungoides? You know, I see some lymphocytes, they look kind of tagging. The clinicals, you know, is it a chronic uh, eczema ver or chronic atopic derm versus MF? You know, I always wonder out there, like, you know, how many immunostains? Do I do any immunostains? Do I do TCR? And I know it depends case by case, mm -hmm. but what's kind of your basic approach for rule out MF? Yeah, so for early MF is often difficult to diagnose. Yeah. It might take years. Uh, and it might look very obvious like MF clinically, but the histopath might lag quite some time. I've seen that many times, yeah. Know. So quite often the dermatologists actually start treating them as if they have early MF, mm -hmm. you know, before the pathology catches up. Uh, I think make sure that the biopsies are from untreated lesions. Uh -huh. Quite often, you know, they're biopsying lesions that had, you know, topical steroids. So mm -hmm. you're not going to see epidermotropism. Right. You know, if the lesion had recent... You know, Does light produce that same thing if they have UV? Their UV, uh, UV treatment. Or even, you know, a lot of sun exposure, you know, mm -hmm. so definitely they'll move away the lymphs from the epidermis and then it won't be that It's really hard, yeah. So a good biopsy, lots of epidermis, you know. I, I prefer big shapes okay. than a small punch. Because you're seeing more of the epidermis. More epidermis, more chance to see, you know, the epidermotropism. It's often very patchy in early MF. Mm -hmm. Uh, immunostains, I only do if I can actually see which are the typical cells. Uh -huh. If they're not obvious to me on the h and &E, I think the immunostains are very difficult to interpret, you know. It, yeah, it, it seems like the times that you need the stains the most, they're the least useful, right? Those early yeah. cases, they end up being, you know, not yeah. very helpful. That's what it seems like to me, at least. So if I cannot tell, I, I don't do immunostains. I do like to do PCR, but at least in more than one biopsy. Okay. So I want to do at least two biopsies, either different sites or different intervals. Mm -hmm. you know, same location at different times. Okay. You know? I think if you find a matching T cell clone, that's pretty good. If the same know. peak matches, okay, yeah. that makes sense. It's not sense. 100%, but it's, can help. Know, it definitely helps, especially for early MF. Okay. You know. Now, plaque stage, you know, it's, you know, that's the textbook. Pretty easy, you right. Know, you have, you know, the pattern, you see lots of dermatropism, portrait microabscesses. So I think the struggle is diagnosing past stage of math. Okay. Dr. Jaffe gave a talk here at ASDP mm -hmm. a couple of years ago, and she talked a lot about Epstein-Barr related yes. skin diseases. And I thought, wow, I don't think I'm doing enough Eber Epstein-Barr virus-ish. How do you decide when to do Epstein-Barr virus staining in skin? So there are clues, you know, so I start from the clinical, you know, uh, you know, somebody has both skin and lung lesions. That's a clue for LYG, uh -huh. right? So, you know, I'll get EBV in that case. Any immunodeficiency, whether it's primary, acquired, you know, post-transplant, any biologics, you know, if there's a history of immunodeficiency or even age, you know, mm -hmm. advanced age by itself can... It's kind of immune suppressing, right? Immune senescence. So uh, I'll check EBV on those, you know, scenarios as well. In young patients, you know, if they have any clues for hydroa, like, you know, lesions on sun-exposed skin, facial edema, or any child that has you know, severe reactions to mosquito bites. There'll mm -hmm. be a clue for, you know, EBV disease as well. Uh, in terms of the H&E, if I see angel destruction, a lot of necrosis, like geographic necrosis, uh, or if I see, you know, lots of ulceration, you know, that's a clue for, you know, something like that's EBV Mucocutaneous positive. ulcer or something ulcer, like that? Uh -huh. Yeah, so an ulceration at that site as well. Okay. Uh, and in terms of the immunophenotype, if it's cytotoxic, I generally check EBV. Okay. Because you know, it might be a gamma delta or CD8 positive CTCL, but I'll make sure that it's not, you know, maybe NK to some form of nasal type. So if it's cytotoxic phenotype, lots of CD56 expression, I'll check EBV as well. Okay. And for the B cells, if you see lots of large B cells that express CD30, there'll be a clue they might be ABV positive process. Okay. And are there any stains that you find that are used often, but are not very useful in heme path. I know like in soft tissue, I hate my mentin. Okay. I see people do it all the time and it never does any good. And I always am ranting about how much I hate it. Are there any stains in heme path that you just are like, oh, I hate seeing this? I don't have any specific stains that I don't like. There's no vimentin uh, of heme path then, uh, okay. Not really, but uh, I would say that people in heme path rarely do CD45. Okay. Like LCA, that's a, that's rarely used in heme path. Okay. Unless, let's say, working up a classic Hodgkin's case, mm -hmm. for example. But generally, if you're just going to demonstrate 
that it is a lymphoid process. You know, 45 is really not that helpful. You know, you can have a you know a large B-cell lymphoma, a leukemia that don't they don't have CD45. Yeah. So it, it's it sounds like the environmental or myeloma, right? They get it for myeloma, 45. Exactly. So you know, I find, I think 45 is you know often not helpful unless I'm thinking of a specific disease that I want to see if it's positive or negative. Okay. Like, like in the Hodgkin setting, which in the skin we don't really see Hodgkin's. Uh, yeah, have you ever seen a case in the skin, a real case of Hodgkin in the skin? I think unless the patient has, you know, advanced stage four like disease, known, okay. you know, direct extension, I wouldn't worry about Hodgkin's disease. Right, because it's going to be, what, either like lymphomatoid papulosis yeah. or something else, right? Or the EBV positive. Or, uh-huh, you know, okay. Then it's also, they can often have, you know, the Hodgkin's look. So I would not worry about Hodgkin's disease in the skin. You know, we really don't believe in primary cutaneous disease anymore. Okay. A lot of those case reports we think are mostly LYP. Okay, that's what I, and I asked Dr. Jaffe that same thing. She's like, uh-uh, they just, yeah. unless they've got the advanced. So that's good to know. Because mm-hmm. um, I hear people talk about that still from time to time. And I, yeah. I thought, I've never seen that. I don't think it's real. Mm-hmm. What do you see the future of cutaneous heme path? Um, what do you see happen over the next 10 or 20 years? Where do you envision things going? I think we're going to have better data for rare things you okay. know a lot of the rare lymphomas we you know are just joining forces different centers you know getting all their cases together and doing very large series to see any patterns or you know even changes in classification mm-hmm. you know uh, since i've started you know working the classification for lymphomas changed three times wow you know so i think that will continue you know basically every five to seven years there will be an update to the lymphoma classification. I feel that's part of what makes it yeah. challenging to me is that it's just, I feel like I'm starting to get the hang and then it all gets, uh, you know, redone, so. Yeah, so I think that, that will continue. I think exciting things and which will continue and are um, already happening would be that we are realizing that immunophenotype is not everything. Mm-hmm. That, you know, each lymphoma has its own gold standard. You know, there's no single gold standard for all lymphomas. Each disease ha- has their own gold standard. And a within that disease, you can have, you know, some variation in phenotype, you know, so I think that's something exciting. And I think the greater use of the LPD label, Mm -hmm. you know, uh, a criticism of HEMPAF before was that everything was lymphoma or leukemia, right? Uh It's in a case to a hematopathologist, it's cancer. And then some of it's really bad and some of it's not at all, right? Yeah, so I think now that we have this, it's some of the benign neoplasms, Uh the very indolent neoplasms in HEMPAF, now they get an LPD label as opposed to everything being called cancer or lymphoma. And then as we get follow-up, maybe we'll have a better idea of how do these actually behave over yeah. time in a large series. Yeah. That's cool. Yeah. Well, that's exciting. And like I said, you actually, I felt like hearing you talk and looking at your book actually gave me hope that I think <laughs> that maybe I can start to understand. It's complicated still, yeah. but you explain it in such a practical way. And I, I think, like you said, this is a book that I wish I would have had when I was in training, and I'm glad I have it now. And I think that it's going to really benefit our field. So yes. thank you very thank much you. for doing that. And thanks there for, uh, there is hope. There okay. Is hope, yeah. I'll remember that. Thanks. Okay. Thank you.